Hey everyone, welcome back to The Mystic in the Woods. I'm Kate, and today we are doing a viewer Q&A. So I saw this idea on a couple of other channels, right? Doing these like viewer Q&As when you hit certain subscriber levels. So I thought that since we just hit 2000 subscribers over here on YouTube and also 2000 followers over on Instagram, that we would go ahead and do a Q&A. Now, I have been away from YouTube for a few weeks. I have had, we've had beginning hit with snowstorms and my son has had a really bad ear infection and it's just been one thing after the next at my house. But I'm very excited to be back making videos again. And this Q&A seems like a great way to get started with it anyway. So I have compiled all the questions that were submitted and I have them broken up by category so that we can move through them in an organized fashion. And I'm going to try to keep the answers brief so that we don't end up with like too long of a video. All this is probably already going to be pretty long and chatty. So if there's anything that I talk about today that you would like a full video on, like a separate video, just let me know in the comments and I am more than happy to do that. Okay, so tarot is our first category. And I had a question about journaling. So would love to know how you journal with tarot and oracle pulls. So before I talk about this, I just want to mention that your daily practices should work for you, right? So if journaling doesn't work for you, as in like you do not have the capacity or the time, sorry, there's like a um, squirrel really performing some acrobatics right outside my window. <laughs> um, there's a big emphasis on journaling in the community, which is great because it can be a really powerful tool. However, if journaling daily is not accessible for you for whatever reason, please know that that's okay. I do not journal every single day. In fact, it kind of comes in waves. So there are two things that I do. So first, I really do try to just at least keep track of all of my pulls. So every time I pull cards, I try to at least just like write down the date and what I pulled. So that I can see patterns because it's really hard to see patterns if you're not record keeping. And on top of that, it's easy to think like, oh my God, I keep pulling the tower. This is so bad. When really you've pulled the tower like twice. Now pulling the tower twice might be significant, but it's not the same as pulling it a dozen times, but it can feel that way if we're not keeping track. So even if I'm not gonna journal, I do at least try to keep track of my pulls. Now, secondly, when I do go to journal, I usually lay my cards out, write down my first thoughts that come to me, and then um, I'm gonna go to the guidebooks. And whatever guidebooks for my decks, and I'm gonna write down anything that is standing out to me as relevant, anything that feels important. And I'm gonna write those down and I'm gonna journal from there about how those uh, meanings or nuggets of information apply to the question that I've asked or my daily life or whatever it is. I'm gonna journal from there. And really that's all I do. And the reason that I like to do this though is because what I find is that for me and from listening to other people speak as well, is that often it's really easy for us to like do a tarot pull for ourselves. Let me just grab a deck. And um, like pull a couple of cards. So 10 of, 10 of swords, <laughs> the fool. Um, and just go, all right, well, like I know the fool means something new and I know that the 10 of swords means like an ending. And so it's fairly easy to either say, don't do the new thing because it's not gonna end well or let something end so that you can step into something new, right? Cause like these are the basic, like we all get that. But then in order to get anything else, I think that it's important that you either speak it out loud or you write it down because sometimes the reading can get stuck. So when I'm reading for other people, the information just comes out of my mouth. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to think about it. When I'm journaling or reading for myself, I mean, it's like the reading can get stuck and that's all I'll get is just the, like what I just told you about these two cards. Journaling or speaking it out into a camera or something allows it to actually move out through you so that you can actually get your message. So that is how I journal with my tarot and oracle. It is very simple. In my um, how to get more out of your daily draws video, I talk a little bit more about journaling and like using tarot to create journal prompts and things like that, or to um, specifically to like select decks that have journal prompts. And anyway, so there's a little bit more about journaling in there and I'd be happy to do a separate video on this. So that's how I do it. It's actually very simple. Um, I don't put too much pressure on my journaling practice really. 
Um, okay, when you get a new deck, Oracle or Tarot, do you do a deck intro bonding routine of any sort? So, again, this is actually going to be a very simple answer. Um, I really kind of don't. So I have a very short routine to clear the deck, and that's pretty much all that I always do. Now, I used to have a more in-depth clearing process and bonding process and like doing a introduction spread or an interview spread. And I think that if that helps you and that works for you, you should absolutely do that. Okay. Like a thousand percent. If you like doing that, do that. I really only do that. I'm just going to move a couple of things out of my way here. There. Um, I really only do that when I am not sure why a deck came into my collection. And usually I am pretty sure. I will do more uh, like interview spreads or bonding type of things if I'm really struggling to connect with the deck. And then the only sort of alternative to that is for example, like if I get a new deck, like I just um, got the, does anybody actually know how to pronounce this one? The Low, Low Putin Oracle? I know I just got this. And I did do a quick interview spread because I have a specific deity in mind that I'm going to be working with this deck for. Um, so I did a quick interview sort of in that way. Like, how is this deck going? How, how is the day? How are the deity and I going to use this deck to communicate? What are we going to be working on? Those kinds of things. And very often when I do that, though, I will just choose a spread from the guidebook with the intention being around... Um, the thing I'm planning to do with the deck or the deity that I'm planning to work with, with the deck. Um, advice on how to really connect with tarot and deep dive. Okay, so beyond doing like a very intellectual study with tarot where you can get like the Rider Waite Smith or any other deck that has lots of symbolism in it and you can do a like analytical study, right? You can dedicate a journal and um, use a couple pages for each each card and really like study the correspondences and the colors that are in it and and what astrological signs it's associated with and the planets it's associated with and um you know what all the symbols in the card mean and all of those things which is certainly one way to do a deep dive study is do that very intellectual study of the tarot um, I talk about this a lot actually in that daily draw video, like how to get more of your daily draw, because I do think that daily draws are a really powerful way to connect with the tarot more deeply and to, um, to not just deep dive, but to know how you're going to interact with the tarot. So one of my favorite ways to do this, but you can go watch that video is to pull a morning draw. So like, what do I need to know about my day today? Or as I'm moving through my day and I get the two of swords. I can watch for the Two of Swords moment throughout my day. I can do my journaling in the morning, whatever. And then in the evening, I pull another card and I say, what do I need to know about how the Two of Swords played out in my day today? And now I have the Seven of Swords. Now I can really go back and look at my day and say, how did the Two of Swords play out? How was I interacting with that energy today? What moments did I have that really made me think Two of Swords? And how does the Seven of Swords apply to that? How did this energy interact with this energy throughout my day? And this will really allow you to see how the cards work together, um, how they pull meaning out of each other, and also what or how each card in the tarot is going to interact and read for you. So that you can develop not just your understanding of the, the like traditional meanings of the card, but also your own personal meanings for the card and how your own how the tarot how the tarot is going to interact with you. And it helps you to become more accurate, it helps you develop that personal layer on top of that intellectual study layer. So that is my favorite way to do that. Um, an example of this is which I've probably given before, and I'm sorry, I can't keep my hair out of my eyes, it's not on my face today, um, is that with the Three of Swords, this happened with me. So I always, like, I knew what the Three of Swords meant, but I had trouble, like, knowing what the Three of Swords means. And I pulled it as my daily draw, and then throughout the day, the exact Three of Moments, Three of Swords moment happened. And I instantly knew that was a Three of Swords moment. I inflicted it on somebody else, 
And since then, sometimes it's inflicted on me, sometimes I inflict it on other people, but the Three of Swords shows up in this very specific way for me when I read tarot. And it doesn't abandon the traditional meaning, but it grows on the traditional meaning. And then when I was able to pull my evening card, you know, messages about being more careful with my words, etc., etc., right? Um, these types of messages came up. And so it really allowed me to understand the Three of Swords. So that's my favorite, really my favorite way to do that. Um, okay, does your tarot work with ancestors border on spirit communication? So this question, I'm really going to say it depends. And I'm going to say that because two things. First of all, my ancestry practice is actually very simple and it is um, not a huge piece of my practice. So I thought it was going to be. A couple years ago, I really thought that it was something I was going to dive into. And I just was pulled in other directions. Now, I do have an ancestral altar. I do leave it offerings. I consider it more like ancestral elevation type of a practice. Um, I occasionally pull a card. I really don't like use tarot to communicate with my ancestors very often. So is it spirit communication? The thing about spirit communication, spirit work, is that within different traditions, that means very specific things and very specific and different things. So if we consider our ancestors spirits and we consider pulling tarot cards to get messages from them, communication, then yes, I suppose it is spirit communication. Um, however, again, these words, especially when put together, have wildly different meanings within different traditions. And so depending on the way that we are at, like what we mean when we say spirit communication could wildly change my answer, especially because it's not something that I do a lot of, if I'm being really honest. Um, okay, next question. How do you read with more than one deck? So I have, again, a whole, um, let me see if I can find, here, we'll use this one, but, oh, there it is. This is the deck I'm looking for. Wisdom of the Wild Things Oracle, I knew it was sitting here. Um, I have a whole series on this on the channel and it's in its own playlist. You can go find it there. I think I did like three or four videos on how I pair decks, how I read with multiple decks. I will use two decks to, I will use one deck to clarify another deck. So if I pull like the, um, here's the seven of wands and I want clarity, I might pull a, you know, a Oracle card to get a direction with which to go on that card or to help clarify it a little bit more. But another way that I have been doing this, especially lately is pulling three cards from a tarot deck. And then I will just pull in other cards from other decks specifically with the intention of saying, what else do you have to add to the conversation? So I might ask a question and pull three cards from the tarot deck. So Knight of Wands, Page of Cups, King of Swords. Okay. Um, and then I might say, what else do you have to add to the conversation? And I get transition from the Wisdom of the Wild Things Oracle. And there's a lot of directions we can go here. That really adds to the conversation, especially when we have a little bit of a weird reading like this, where we have a page, a knight, and a king, but they're all in different suits. Okay, so where are we transitioning between these energies? See, um, I will also sometimes ask one deck a general question and um, you know, here's the Ten of Cups. And then I might say, well, what's beneath that? Like what's at the root of this issue? I might start to ask other decks more specific questions around that issue, um, especially because I have specific decks that I use in specific ways. And so I may bring one of those decks in very specifically to understand something about the situation. Now, having said that, again, you can go, um, watch the playlist on reading with multiple decks. I'm happy to like add videos to that series if there's something specific you want more videos on. But I am a very messy and intuitive reader. So I am just like pulling cards from different decks as I feel pulled to do so. I usually have three decks that I'm actively working with and then I, I tend to have um, a variety of decks sitting out on my desk and I'm just pulling from cards as I feel like I should. When I'm doing a daily draw for myself, I usually have two or three decks in rotation that I'm using at any one time. And then I will very often pull from one from each deck for my daily draw and read them all as one cohesive spread or one cohesive conversation. That's kind of how I do that. Okay. 
Um, is there a deck you held in your hands and began to work with and it brought you to your knees? So I have three decks that are quite emotional decks for me right from the beginning, right out of the gate. So one was my Divine Feminine Oracle and you can go see that deck review to hear the whole story, but I was in the middle of a family emergency. I knew absolutely nothing about reading cards. I'm literally just following the instructions in the guidebook. And I had an absolutely flooring experience with this deck. Not only was I pulling the same cards over and over for myself, um, the guidebook was like echoing words back to people. So I was with a lot of family because we were going through a family emergency and um, I was just pulling cards for them periodically because we were all together waiting out this family emergency. And um, the deck would like echo back to them things that they had said earlier in the day and then give them guidance on it. And I was so floored. And looking through that deck for the first time, there were like three different cards that really brought up huge waves of emotion as I was looking through it. Um, another deck is my Spirit Keeper's Tarot that um, looking through it for the first time again, I was having waves and waves of emotion. And that deck and I have an interesting relationship because it it won't just answer my questions for me. Like it wants me to approach it with a certain level of reverence and ceremony and um, like pomp and circumstance and kind of all the things. But when I am in a situation to read with that deck, it almost always brings me to tears. And then the third one is my Earthbound Oracle. No, this is the Earthbound Oracle. I love my Earthbound Oracle, but I am talking about the Illuminated Earth Oracle. That's the one, Illuminated Earth Oracle. Um, I can feel that deck in my body. Like from the moment that I opened it and looked through it for the first time, I can feel that artwork in my body. And so that is a very um, special deck for me as well. So those are the three that came to mind when I was first reading through the questions. Okay. Do you equate a card in tarot with a certain god or goddess you work with or demon demoness? Okay, so I'm just checking the time here. Um, I had to think about this question a little bit because I mostly assert, associate specific decks with specific deities. So like, um, I have a specific deck for in the Infernals. I have a specific deck for um, Asherah and Mary Magdalene and kind of, you know, like I have specific decks to work with these deities. Um, but I do have a handful of cards that always come up that make me think of those specific deities or those specific, at least those energy, the energy that those specific deities carry. So one is the Empress, really makes me think of Eve, to be totally honest, um, which is a very important guide for me. Asherah tends to make me think of the world card because of her association with the world tree and this idea of containing everything and cycles and new beginnings and kind of all that piece of it. Um, of course, the devil makes me think of Lucifer because of his ability to really shine light on the chains and the things that are holding us back in that shadow work perspective. The star feels very much like Green Tara to me, so very often that card is associated with Kuan Yin. And Kuan Yin and Green Tara have um, sort of adjacent, like they're 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 different, they're different, but they have overlapping themes and energies in the way that many of these deities do. Lilith makes me think of the the Queen of Wands. So those are the ones that all kind of came to me when I was reading through this question. Are those are kind of some of the cards? that make me think of specific beings that I work with regularly. Um, okay, so then that kind of bridges us into deity work. We had a few different questions on deity work. So one was about my take on male deity work and sacred masculine spirituality. So I have a lot of thoughts on this actually. This is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. I don't have <laughs> cohesive ways or comp like a uh, co well cohesive yes but um easily like like I, I consider myself a teacher I, I've always been in a teaching position not with little kids but with adults um in every career that I've had I've always about teaching people things and so I, I really like to be able to teach in a clear way and to express myself in a way that really helps my students to understand what I'm talking about and apply it to their own situation 
and I really pride myself on that. And um, I don't have that yet for this question. So I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts and then I'm probably eventually going to make a video specifically on this. And if that's something you guys would like, please let me know in the comments to talk a little bit more about sacred masculine um, spirituality and working with uh, various gods and things like this. So I think that it is really important for all of us in whatever way this looks for in it, everybody as an individual. Um, cause I think it's going to look different for everybody. I think it's important for everybody to heal their relationship with the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine. And I love the conversations that talk about why the problem or why speaking about them in a duality like that is a problem. I love those conversations. Um, and I think that sometimes it's actually helpful to speak about it on the duality or on the polarity of masculine and feminine because when we are growing up, we are conditioned to see and to notice different traits and different characteristics in the people in the world around us, to label them feminine or masculine, and then to feel a specific way about them based on how we have um, associated them with masculine or feminine characteristics. And what we have done as a society, so this is just a vast generalization here really quick, is as on a societal level, we have said that anything emotional, intuitive, nurturing um, is feminine. Anything that is about protection and aggression and leadership and... Um, straight thinking and clarity of mind over emotion is masculine and that masculine again societally this from my lens stems from the garden of eden story which i have a lot of thought i have a whole shadow work program about the garden of eden um i have a lot of thoughts on that story this idea within Western society, in the collective unconscious and through societal programming, that masculine is the default, it is closer to the divine, and feminine is deviant, closer to the earth, and less. Now, this has done everyone a disservice. Men, women, non-binary folks, um trans people is not everybody a disservice because not only do we take these things that are feminine and label them as less the idea of what it means to be masculine that is up on a pedestal within society is not a healthy integrated form of masculinity necessarily because it has been stripped of anything that's deemed feminine and put over here and that feminine, like, um, if we're thinking about, like, a god-goddess, and you don't need to work with a god and goddess specifically in your practice. But, like, if you, you know, you, like, if we're looking at a god-goddess combo, Yeshua, Mary Magdalene, then not only are they both balanced within themselves, and they have a healed, integrated masculine and feminine within themselves, they have each other as well. And right now in our society, we have this toxic masculine idea not balanced by a sacred feminine that has also been stripped of part of itself that has been labeled feminine. Men can be gentle. Men can be nurturing. Men can like things that are beautiful. We all know this, right? But that has all been labeled feminine that has been labeled less. So if you, for example, are somebody who was socialized as a man who falls somewhere else on the spectrum, like like the, the LGBTQ, like you know, spectrum here. It is looked at as deviant because you were supposed to be male, but you're now feminine and how that's negative and that's bad because feminine is less, right? It also sets us up for this duality of the divine being better than the earth and that there's somehow something inherently bad about the earthly plane and inherently bad about what it means to be human and inherently bad about what it means to be connected to the earth. 
and that sets us up for a really um, problematic duality. And so, of course, when we're talking about healing this, part of that is reclaiming the sacred feminine within feminine bodies, within feminine stories, within feminine archetypes. It is also about allowing the masculine to reclaim the pieces of the masculine that are also those things. And about the healthy structure that the masculine can offer and the healthy linear thinking that the masculine can offer and kind of all of these different things. And so I think that we have conversations all the time about healing the sacred feminine and reclaiming the sacred feminine. And I talk about that all the time, reclaiming the sacred feminine. I think that that's important. But it is also important to reclaim the healthy, sacred masculine. Because what we have been raised with in society, like if you are in a Christian Western society that has been built upon Christian values, whether or not people like that's just the case here, um, that God is not necessarily in a lot of traditions a healthy, integrated masculine God, right? We're actually looking at like toxic masculinity. And the problem here is that stories matter. The myths we tell, the stories we read, the stories we see on TV. This is why representation is so important of seeing LGBTQ relationships on TV, about seeing people of color on TV, about seeing all, like, like just as TV is one example of storytelling. This is why it matters is because storytellers create meaning for society. And when the stories are all about one, one version of what it means to be masculine, quiet and stoic and um, non-emotional and like whatever, like in the classic novels and like all the things, right? Shakespeare, you know, like all these things that have shaped society. We aren't actually seeing the whole population. So when we say it's important to reclaim the sacred feminine, it's important to bring the sacred feminine back into religion and the stories of women back into history. It's important not because women are better than men, but because they're half the population. It is, and so we don't get a full picture without the stories of the women. But I think the other half of the coin is true there, where when we only see stories about one specific strain of masculinity, we aren't seeing the stories of all the other versions of masculinity, all the other characteristics of it. And it's not necessarily because those other characteristics are better. It's because they're also there and they should also be represented. So this is like a really rambly way, you know, this is again, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about and I've been working on a lot within myself. Um, but I think that I don't have a great way to talk about it yet outside of what I've just said. But we all, I think it's really important that we all heal our relationships with the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine because they're both important as well as healing a relationship with the queer god and goddesses, the um, non-binary ones, all the things, okay? All the things. But when we put one version of masculinity up on a pedestal, we did a disservice to the rest of the population, not just to women. And that includes men and people who identify as men. And um, I think that working with male guides, male deities, you know, which really like when we're talking about deity, we're, we're, we're putting a mask on them so that we have something to understand when we give them a label like male or female. Um, but working with masculine deity can be really healing for everybody to see what that energy actually is and that energy actually shows up as. And in order to heal society, we do need to reclaim the sacred feminine and we do need to heal the, the sacred feminine, but we also need the sacred masculine to actually make a res resurgence as well, whatever that word is. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know if any of that makes sense yet. Uh, I can do other videos on that. 
Um, I actually have a couple of workshop ideas for working with masculine deities um, that at some point uh, I think will be ready to, to come to fruition. And um, if there's anything else that you guys want me to talk about with that, let me know. I, that, like I said, this is still very much kind of in the cauldron for me, like still being stirred around, still being coming, coming into a way that I can teach it, into a framework and words and sentences that I can use to teach it. Um, but I hope that, that makes sense and I hope that gives you something and I will would love to do more videos on that if that's something you guys would like to learn about. Okay, and we can certainly use the structure of tarot to do those. Actually, maybe we'll do some shadow work in tarot on some of the masculine cards, the kings, the emperor, the hierophant, um, <laughs> some of those cards. Okay. Two more questions. So one is about priestess training. So who are you training with and how long is the training? So I'm currently engaged in training to be a priestess. Um, and I am working with the priestess presence temple. So you can look them up. They have a whole program. I am learning a lot. I'm really enjoying the program so far. It's something I'll be happy to speak on more later in the year about um, just my path with stepping onto, you know, my journey with stepping onto the priestess path, claiming that title, choosing to join a program, um, things like that. That's, if you guys want more on that, let me know. You can ask, you know, let me know in the comments below. In the comments below. Um, and that's something that I will, will be happy to speak on a little bit more, I think a little later in the year. So let me know if you have any more specific uh, questions on that. All right, and then the other final question, again, miscellaneous. So behind the scenes prep work, camera, microphone, editing software, how do you decide what content to make? So this is gonna be probably a really, um, like a letdown of an answer. I use my iPhone. I use an app called Pro Movie. I'll put like it here or the link below or something. Um, to run the camera on the iPhone so that it's easier for me to control like the lighting settings and things like that. Um, because I can never do it on the camera, like the, the native camera app you're supposed to be able to, I can never make it work. I don't know. This app works great for that. I edit in the iMovie on my Mac and I use a Deity microphone. Here, let me see if I can. This one. I use that Deity microphone. I have a ring light and, um... That's that. And the background music just comes from the YouTube, like music options that they allow you to download and put in your videos. That's it. That's all, that's all I do. I am hoping to upgrade some things here in the next few months. Um, I'm going to be moving and I will have an office that is not like right now my desk is in a window, which is really good. Like the natural lighting is really great for videoing unless it's too sunny or it's not sunny enough or like whatever. So I will be hopefully upgrading some of my equipment when I move there. I do have a like a mirrorless, I have a, G, a Panasonic GH4 camera that I use for photography. Um, I don't have the right lens to use it for videoing well. And the couple times I've tried to use it, I haven't been able to make it work the way that I want. So I've considered getting a new lens or getting a new camera and kind of upgrading things and maybe eventually I will, but right now I just really like the ease of this setup. So that's all I do. I just use like my, like the stuff that came on my iPhone and my Mac, um, except for the Pro Movie app, which I don't even think I paid for. And <laughs> that's it. Um, as far as choosing content to make, I have a running list and um, of content that I would like to talk about, things that I enjoy talking about, things that I like to teach about. Um, different oracle and deck tarot deck lists that come to mind like I've added a couple of those to my list my content list this week like to do one on animal decks and um, goddess decks because I don't actually have a lot of those in my collection because I'm exceptionally picky so I thought about so I think about things like that and I put them on my list as far as being a content creator you do of course need to like play the algorithm game and I find uh, that's like a frustrating thing across the board for us right as content creators. So I do try to like once per month choose a video topic that I think will hit the algorithm well, like doing a top 10 Oracle deck list or um, like doing a tag that's going on really like uh, really circulating well. But mostly the most important thing to me when I'm choosing what videos to make is I only make content that I really do want to make. Like I only 
record videos, when I really feel like talking about that topic, when I really want to talk about that topic. Um, because otherwise, for me, it doesn't come across well. Like, it, it, people don't engage with it, people don't um, resonate with it, and I get that because, like, I don't even want to be there. <laughs> Why would you want to be there? So I only, I do only make content that I do really want to talk about. So having said that, I have my list. Some topics do require research, and I do research those and make sure that I've, like, I've got my talking points and the things that I want to talk about. Other videos, like this one, like, I read the video, like, I as I was making my list of uh, questions, I thought about them a little bit, but I don't have like a list of talking points for this video. So yeah, it's really, there's really like, I just randomly, I just randomly choose things I wanna talk about. I do sometimes again, because I am a content creator and I'm, I'm a business owner and I do offer like workshops periodically throughout the year and shadow work programs and things like that, that um, I will think about like what workshop am I gonna be offering and are there videos I wanna talk about that would line up with that to help people like learn about it or get what, you know, see what it might, what see what it might be like to work with me. Like, yes, I do put some of that forethought into it, but mostly I really just make the videos that I wanna talk about. Um, yeah, so this is just really, there's not that much to it. But that is it. Those are all the questions. Those are all my answers. Again, if there's anything you want me to talk more about, if there's anything you want a full video on, if this has sparked new questions for you, absolutely let me know in the comments below and I will see you in the next video. Bye.